I totally changed my pictures like this afternoon. So I'm going to have to be looking at my screen too because I talk a lot about my personal life in with my business because it's been such a, you know, a meshed thing here. So just to introduce myself a little more. Um, Steve mentioned I love to race triathlon. It's been something I've been doing since before I was a wife, before I was a mother. I, I was a high school runner for Mountain View in Orem and I ran for Southern Utah for a couple years before transferring here after my mission. And so I love to swim. I swim down this Spanish Fork Reservoir, where people let um, goldfish loose in there every year, and they get bigger and bigger and creepier, and it's very exciting. And I, I, yes, I am one of those people who has a bike that costs more than my car, and the really weirdo-looking helmet. But I love biking. I ride around. I have a group of guys I ride with out of Springville, and they are just fantastic riders, and we hit Woodland Hills all the time. I was just down in St. George riding for a couple, couple of days. This is me finishing in all my sweaty glory at the Spudman, which is a little tiny triathlon in Burley, Idaho, that I actually raced 18 times before I won that blasted race. But I did that as a 19-year-old freshman in college, went with some of my friends to race the Spudman, and I was like, I'm going to win this race. And then some years I would go and I'd be pregnant and I'd be, like, be last. Or some years I missed because of my mission. Or I'd be pregnant with twins and then I would just do the swim, have my friends do the bike and the run. And then finally, two years ago, I won that thing after 18 years. So persistence, that's just what I'm saying. This is my cute family. Aren't they just cute? We're up at Bear Lake. This is like what takes all my time and energy. They're very messy humans. And my 15-year-old has discovered girls. And he got caught at Reem's grocery store holding hands with someone, according to the ladies at church who report upon him. <laughs> and my nine-year-olds are twins. Those, that boy and girl there, they're twins. And they're the ones that keep me running. They are, they're super fun. And my six-year-old, she runs the house. We love to travel. This is up at Glacier National Park. I love taking them just local trips, you know, Four Corners Glacier, Lava Hot Springs. We run around a lot. They want a home lunch every day. We catch the bus outside, all kinds of mommy, you know, mommy glorious things like this. We have a gigantic rabbit. His name is Ozzy. He roams free in the, in the backyard. We just keep it fenced, and he runs around, and we plant a garden just for him to eat. And he's, you know, everyone's baby. To keep the rabbit company, we got a turtle. And unfortunately, the turtle does not roam free. The turtle lives in a tank on my kitchen counter. And he's my living food storage. Because we won't eat Ozzy. He's a member of the family. But if things got hard, the turtle might have to go. I mean, young women, these are my my maids. There's 14 of them. That takes up every Wednesday and Sunday. They're super lively. They're my spies on my boy because they're the same age. So we always get the report, who's in class with Rex? Who's he talking to? What's he doing? They're great. It's super fun. All my kids play soccer. I've got three kids in soccer, two kids in basketball, two kids in piano, one kid in karate. We've got Cub Scouts. We've got Boy Scouts. We've got Young Women's. We're trying to be Mormons who go to church every Sunday. I have a very busy life. So I could just sit down right here, whoops, say the end. And I would expect you all, especially the men, to stand and give me a riotous round of applause, like we're at Cub Scouts right now. Yay! I'm done. My life is over. Should I just sit down? Have a dramatic moment of silence. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, but you wait till your parents and you have four kids and you're running everyone's lives. It could definitely take all my energy doing my, doing my sport, doing my family, doing all my church stuff, and it's been fantastic. But luckily, as, I was, um, as you've learned an introduction about me, I've also enjoyed the marvelous, fantastic opportunity of being an entrepreneur for the last 14 years. And I've got a couple employees now. I've been able to make a good full-time income from my home for over a decade. I've been able to you know, be home with my kids, but also be working, being engaged in the business world. It's been such a blessing in my life and something that I recommend to everyone, whether you end up being an entrepreneur who works for yourself or simply to foster the entrepreneur mindset, which is to be looking out for opportunities for yourself to, to better your financial situation and to be um, self-motivated, to get yourself up every morning and set goals for yourself, to be someone who accomplishes something um, that they set out to do without knowing the outcome. You know, these are mindsets that I think serve you as students and serve our Heavenly Father. They serve our community. And it's just something that, that I'm, mm, I'm passionate about. So let me tell you my story of how I got into business. Um, my, 
my husband and I graduated from, he graduated from Southern Utah. I had, our, I had already graduated up here. We had a little bit of money saved up. And neither of us had business background. He was a communications grad also. But we had this wild-haired idea that we wanted to start our own business. I had one child at the time. And I was working this cool job for Southern Utah University where I was this high school relations lady. So I would visit all the high schools and tell everyone, hurrah, go to Southern Utah. And it was really fun, but it involved travel about nine months of the year. It just wasn't something that I wanted to continue doing with a small child. And with a little bit of money, we thought, well, let's start a business or let's buy a business. And we kind of threw that around. And, got, and we, um, we called around, literally out of want ads, called a business broker, which um, I, at the time, did not even know existed. But there are folks who sell businesses, from small to large businesses, just like anyone would sell a house. You know, They're a realtor for businesses. And we went and we said, we have this little amount of money. We don't want to do food. We don't want to do retail. Um, what have you got that's for sale anywhere in the West? You know, let's, let's just check it out. And so we looked at this UPS store. It wasn't UPS brand, but it was like that. It was a little mailing store, and I thought that could be pretty cool. But the drawback to that one was that the store um, only made money if the owners of the store worked it, which meant I would be stuck in my little store from you know, 9 to 8 every day, Monday through Saturday, and thought, that's not going to work well with my kids either. And we looked at a dry cleaner, which on paper looked really good, because the profits were making $40,000 a year, which sounded pretty good right out of college, being in 1998. So we actually went to the dry cleaner, and we saw all the equipment they had. And it was ancient. It looked like something out of 1950s scary land, you know, and, and literally steam just coming <laughs> out of the doors. It was like a sweatshop in there. And again, I would have had to be there running the dry cleaning equipment all the time. It was mostly the equipment that turned me off to that one because it didn't look reliable. We actually were introduced to a little business where you were a plant tender and you went to offices and you took care of their plants and you pruned them and watered them. But the market for that seemed kind of slim. And we were just, you know, none of them were really jumping out to us. None of us, were, none of the, none of these little businesses we looked at were really meeting what we wanted, which was flexibility and room to grow and some profitability. Until we got a little, a decent piece of advice from our um, business broker we were dealing with, and it's something that I have, I would definitely recommend to all of you if you're looking into something entrepreneurial. Um, the whole point for me, anyway, of being an entrepreneur is to have the flexibility and the control over my own life. So if you're going to buy a business or, or start a business that's not going to give you any more benefits than it would working for someone else, why in the world take on that responsibility and stress into your own life? The, the UPS store, for example, I would have had to be there all day every day. Oh, for the love of Pete, why would I want to do that when I could work for someone else all day every day and let them take care of the headaches of the overhead and the, the ownership of the business? And really, so, that's, so I started looking at that differently in mind. So we came upon, this is a symbol of all that is good in my life. Do any of you even know what that is? <laughs> Blank stairs. Neither did I. We named this gigantic washing machine. We named it Bathsheba. And she actually had a former life. Before she became my washing machine, she was actually the washing machine at the Provo Temple and did all the whites. But we came across this little tiny business that some kids were running, and they were literally kids because they were leaving on their missions. But they had started this little business in Salt Lake um, where they would take a dirty doormat, and they would launder it in the giant washing machine, and then um, leave a clean one at different offices. And it was a laundry service. Are any of you even familiar with this? Anybody done summer work at Cintas or anything? That was me, too, at your age. I had no idea there was such an industry that existed. There's actually a really big industry. It falls into the dust and linens category of industrial industries. But there's, um, it's, it's called a doormat laundry service or a rental service. We've got a pair of doormats for an office or gas station. or a, you know, It's not for a home. They're for businesses. And we'd go and grab the dirty doormat, leave a clean one, come back the next week and switch it out. So our customers were on a subscription type service. And this you know, was, was meeting all our requirements. We're like, OK, we can do two days a week of driving around and getting the dirty doormats, and then another day a week washing these all, and you hang them up to dry, and go back up the next day. This sounds fantastic. So we bought this lovely business. It was very small. They only had contracts in Salt Lake that made about 1500 bucks a month. But we figured we can double that. That was the goal. So let's double that down to Utah County, and this will make us a good income. 
the name of the business we bought was called AMRAD, which was some acronym for all their brothers and sisters' names. It was pretty weird. They trained us. And then something valuable that came with the purchase of this very small doormat laundry service was a distributorship, which is the rights to buy at wholesale um, and the rights to sell um, from a big doormat manufacturer out of Dalton, Georgia. Because if you're going to launder a doormat every week, you can't just buy it at, you know, at Walmart. It has to be a special kind of doormat, nitro rubber backing, so that you can put it in the washing machine and it'll dry out. That I did not realize was all that valuable. We were just looking at the numbers of how many new customers we could get, how many people we could cram into our idea, again, of working three days a week. This is the idea. Deliveries on Tuesdays, Thursdays, laundry, Wednesdays, boom. And so at the time, I didn't realize how valuable that was, but that's what later became, um, kind of led me to where I am now. We got this sweet van, bought that from BYU Surplus, actually, and drove around. And I was the one who did the deliveries, and my husband did all the cleaning. And I would take the dirty doormats and leave a clean one, and we had our little matching T-shirts. And to this day, on a rainy day, if I'm outside and I smell a dirty, dusty, wet sidewalk, I just get flooded with memories <laughs> of the smell of doormats that are dirty. <laughs> And it was very low tech. I mean, does it get any more low tech than that? Here we are in the tech lecture series. And this had to be literally the lowest of low tech business. It were wiping your feet on the ground, and then we're taking it away and cleaning it. Super low tech. But exactly what we were looking for in terms of entrepreneurship at the time, because it gave us the flexibility to work three days a week and, um, and do pursue other things with our lives. So we grew the business. It was definitely a period of hard work. I did a lot of sales. Um, I joined the Chamber of Commerce, but I didn't just join the Chamber of Commerce and sit back and be like, hey, I joined the Chamber. I went and volunteered for their different committees, and I ran a little business dinner night out. And I'd go, I met every Monday morning at Shoney's, which doesn't even exist anymore, I don't think. But it was down in East Bay. We'd meet at Shoney's with a little leads group where there were people from a bunch of different industries, and we would swap leads with each other, you know, the carpet cleaning guys would give me information about their customers and I'd help the life insurance guy get customers, et cetera. And we just really swapped. It was a lot of, you know, cold calling and networking to grow the business, but within about six months we did have a whole other matching account in Utah County of folks who wanted their doormats cleaned. So it was pretty sweet, you know? That's exactly what we were planning to do. And this is my daddy. And I got to brag for just one second, totally unrelated to this topic, but my dad races triathlon also. I got him into triathlon. He used to run. He's always run. But he wasn't a swimmer and a biker. But then I've lured him into it, and he's excellent at it. That dude is 70, just turned 70 this year. And we raced together in Savannah, Georgia in September. And he was saying it was a half iron man, which is a pretty decent dis distance for anyone, much less for a 70-year-old. And he was telling me, oh, Erica, this is my swan song. I'm going to retire from this long distance no more after this. He goes and qualifies for the world championships, places second in his age division, which qualified him for worlds that went to the top three there. The top three guys in his age division had a combined age of 214 years. He's like old geezers up on the stand with their gold medals, you know? It was awesome. Anyway, so it's not his swan song now. He's going to do one more race. It's only the world championships. But anyway, he was a BYU professor here in the School of Management. He's since retired, thus the freedom to do whatever he wants. <laughs> and he's, he was always very um, business, you know, entrepreneurial mindset. Even though he was a professor, he was always dabbling in other things. I think he was one of the first guys to sell new skin when it came out, and he'd always be consulting on this and that and, um, you know, writing books about customer service and telling people. So he always kind of had an eye for business. Well, 1998, I know y'all were, like, born. What year were you born? Some of you. How old are you? 1988. Okay, so you were 10 years old. Anybody else? Was anyone younger than 10? Oh, mercy. I graduated from high school before you were born. That makes me feel so old. Because I still have this demented idea that I could go back to college and fit right in with y'all. And then I realized that was even before I was born. Anyway, so 1998, internet looks a lot different. My dad, being kind of the business savvy guy, goes to this, um, like, I don't know, a weekend retreat. One of these hoop hurrah things that tell you how to make a million dollars on the internet. And we're going to teach you how to you know, teach you all the mysteries of the internet and come to our hoorah. It was put on by a company called Galaxy Mall, 
Isn't that a great name? Does anybody remember Galaxy Mall? No. They were out of Orem. They actually sold to another company. I think they're still around under a different name. But Galaxy Mall and my dad connected. And they went, he went to the Hoop Hurrah weekend and learned all, how he was going to make all kinds of money on the internet. Part of what Galaxy Mall offered was that they would build three little websites for you. And he said to me, just kind of the magic question, do you, do you want one of these? Because what's he going to do with three websites in 1998? So I said, yeah. And you know, it was funny that he asked me that because I was running into folks who did not want me to clean their doormat for them. And they didn't want to pay me to come every week. But they wanted a good quality doormat. They wanted to buy it from me. They, and if I'm there, they would love to get a big one that you can't buy at Shopco. And they would um, you know, just want to purchase it, but not do the rental side of the business, which is what we had been focusing on. So I said, yeah, that'll be great. I'll just build this website, and I'll sell some doormats to customers who don't want to rent them. It was just kind of a backup is what I was initially thinking. And so I built my sweet stopdirt.com website. It was, oh, it was definitely serendipity. Then my dad just kind of stumbled onto the Galaxy Mall because it was something that I had um, toyed with doing, and I had run into that, selling some doormats, but hadn't really focused on that at all. Um, if you, <laughs> I don't know if I want to take the time to do it, but have you ever gone to archive.org? They have this thing on there called the Wayback Machine. So if you ever want to see what a website looked like 15 years ago, I mean, we can pull it up if you want. I'll probably keep going so we won't, don't run out of time. But if you, <laughs> my website was like the ugliest thing. <laughs> it had some logo that was just this little circle. And I sold, I think, 15 different products. It was just real, real basic. But, it, but like I said, that, that was the purpose of it was just simply as a backup to folks who didn't want to rent my cleaning service from me. So I started StopDirt.com. Um, we started as a drop ship situation. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with, with drop shipping. Do you, does everyone know what that means? OK, I see one sh head shaking. I will discuss it just a little bit, because this is, the, this is the cornerstone to my business. This is drop shipping is the reason. Oh, <laughs> Steve has the Wayback Machine. OK, there's my website from 1998. And I think it says something like, sign up here for your free mat use bulletin. Because that was what Galaxy Mall taught you. You had to give away something for free. Because in 1998, you couldn't be on the internet unless you were giving away something for free. And I had nothing to give away, so I made up something, some informative little thing that would be emailed to people <laughs> about doormats. But um, I, uh, I set my, up my website in, on a dropship platform. Dropship means that you do not actually buy any products before they're sold. You, you sell pictures of the product is what it is. And so I would show a picture of my manufacturer in Dalton, Georgia. As you recall, I had a distributorship with this mat manufacturer in Dalton, Georgia. So I would sell pictures of some of their doormats. People would get on my website, buy it. I have their money. Then I go to the manufacturer in Georgia, buy the mat from them. They ship it directly to my customer. It never comes to me. I'm the middleman. That's still how I do business today. There are a lot of pros to drop shipping, mostly financial pros to drop shipping advantages, because you are not buying anything until you have the money in your pocket. But more importantly for me, um, I'm not running a warehouse. And I'm not having to employ five or six people to literally take the mat and put it in a box and put a shipping label on it and bring it to UPS, et cetera. And so drop shipping was a way for me to not keep inventory and to keep my, my business small. The cons of drop shipping that, have, that I've run into over the years is basically can be summed up in you have much less control. For example, I have um, six suppliers now who drop ship for me from different locations in the country. And um, each of them have their own, their own way of doing things. Each of them have their own way of how fast they can ship. I still work primarily with that same plant in Dalton, Georgia, and they're fantastic. I try to get down there every couple of years and visit. And you know, we send Christmas gifts back and forth. It's, they're, they're friends. And they're very good about getting things shipped out fast. But for example, just this December, they ran into all kinds of crazy, hairy production delays at the plant. And I'm selling stuff hand over fist because not only is it winter, but it's Christmas. 
and I'm selling things through my own website and through Amazon, and we all know that when you order something on Amazon, if it's not on your doorstep two days later, you're like hysterical because it's Amazon. And so <laughs> it, it really caused me so much work and hassle because of production delays at my plant, of which I had no control. Um, they, there's also an issue of, of sending out something. If I want to throw in a flyer with a special or if I want to put in some kind of postcard, it's a lot harder to do. And it really depends on the drop shipper if they're willing to do your own boxes, your own inserts. Some are, some aren't. It depends on your relationship with the manufacturer. Definitely less control. For me, this is why I was drop shipping because I was working from my living room in my pajamas most of the time, lucky to even have half of a brain some days, when, especially when my twins were little. This is why I was drop shipping. It was not for me an option to get a warehouse, to have employees, to stock my stuff. I was up to my eyeballs in all those other things we talked about, in running triathlon and doing my church callings and doing my kids. And business had to fit in with all of it. So drop shipping was a perfect option for me. That's not the case now. All my kids are in school all day. I do still drop ship, but there are a few things I stock now, and I'm exploring other options because I'm not against that idea. But that was something that was a lifestyle choice for me in terms of the business. Oh, and we have company here. <laughs> it's no problem. <laughs> um, it really felt like this. I felt, I mean, I love this little cartoon because that was exactly what I was doing back when I first started this web page, was just, just kind of doing stuff. And I would get, I, I asked my dad, and I got his big kind of phone book size thing that had come from Galaxy Mall that told you how to add your website to free classified ads online. That's a great way to get traffic and how to put your ad in web rings and all these. This was before social networking, before anything. Later, a few years later, came pay per click and I dabbled in that. I mean, I really was just kind of hit and miss doing, um, doing the web page again, kind of as a side thing. When I first started, we were getting seven hits a day. That was some good traffic. <laughs> we were selling a couple mats a week. It was definitely just a supplemental income to what we were doing, driving the blue van, cleaning the dirty mats. Very comfortable. And this could be the end of my story. I could have just left it right there and been like, the end. And that would be awesome. We'd be running this rental service, selling a few mats, etc. But life has a way of marching on and taking you in different directions. And this, again, like I talked about the entrepreneurial mindset. Whether you're working for yourself, or you are educating yourself here at BYU, or you're working for someone else, you got to keep an eye out for what's next. What other opportunities are available to you? What doors can you open for yourself and your families that are going to bless you? Because we all know Heavenly Father wants us to make lots of money. Because when you make lots of money, you can bless so many people and do so many more things with it. So I, we kind of were led in some different ways with the company, and we made a big, bold move for, for various personal reasons and sold the rental side of the business. And I had kind of ramped up the internet side, got real serious about it, and said, I'm not driving that van anymore. I'm pregnant. Notice that. It's not good for business, having the pregnant lady over there with all the doormats, <laughs> among other reasons why I don't want to do it. There was just, it was just time. We sold the mat rental side of the service, kept the distributorship with the, with the mat manufacturer in in Georgia and just went full bore on the website. And I started working that as the, as the full-time job, as full-time as you can when you're from home. Started growing that business the best I could, started taking some courses, um, hiring out some help for parts of it. Sometimes you've got to hire somebody to teach you how to do things when you're an entrepreneur. There's only so much we as an individual can know. So you've got to bring other people on at times. Um, and, at the, and about eight years ago, I started a series of other websites um, we started selling garage flooring at garagestyle.com. That's some sweet race deck made out of Salt Lake. Um, then I started a website called World's Best Mats, which was set up simply as an A-B test to my stopdirt.com website, where I would put advertising marketing into Stop Dirt and do nothing but search engine optimization on this one and kind of compare. It was, I'm not sure what that taught me. It taught me something. And then we did heavydutymats.com, which was all the kind of weird... Um, super industrial mats, like mats for inside your deep freezer that won't get brittle when you roll your cart full of frozen food on it, or mats you stand on when you're welding so you won't burst into flames, and you know things like this. Things that most of my customers didn't need, but that I was marketing toward the industrial market. So we, you know, I started doing that, started 
just pushing forward. Oh, I totally forgot I have these in here. Okay, that's going to be a total sidetrack. But um, same model on all these different websites, dropship. And then this was also a period of time where I started seeking out more suppliers. And I did it by going to different trade shows of the industry I was already in. I was in, like I said, the, the dust and dirt control industry. There's a show every other year in Vegas called The Clean Show. And it's the gathering of all things laundry and dirt related. And then I started branching out with different garage floor folks. And I'll get to, in a minute, kind of the process of that, of how I added new vendors. But just started you know, branching out. But again, all of them had the same criteria for me, which was that I needed to be able to drop ship their product. I'd, that was, if, it, if the supplier would not drop ship for me, they were, for me, off the list at that time. And, I, and these, were on, these, pictures, these next pictures were on the <laughs> Women's Entrepreneurship Lecture Series, and I can't remember why, but let me just show you my cool pictures. I have this obsession with before and after pictures, and I'll find an old picture and then go take an after picture. If you all become Facebook friends with me, you can see them all. <laughs> these are my twins. I have this one flowering rose bush. So these are my twins. Don't they look like Adam and Eve, just like beautiful babies when they were little, like baby Adam and Eve? And then there was the next year, and then there was the next year. Oops. And the next year when they're strangling each other, <laughs> they're such punks. And the most recent year, and I haven't taken another one. And I can't remember why that's in there. Biking. OK, let me get to the next part of my lecture. That's how, OK, so that is how I, um, that's how I got into business. And I hope I didn't, didn't blow over anything. Um, the, the difference that, I, that is happening now in my business compared to 10 years ago, I'm still drop shipping things. But I'm open to not drop shipping things. Now I'm looking into some, some things that I'm going to stock, some things that I'm, I'm going to provide to Amazon for them to fulfill um, in bulk. I sell on multiple marketplaces now. I sell for, through eBay, Amazon, and my own website, and Sears.com, which has been interesting. There's a lot to be learned in selling through different marketplaces, but it's expanded my reach. So I sell a lot of. Um, I sell to a lot of homeowners, which has been kind of catch-22, because that's not the customer I really want. What I want are the facility maintenance guys or the property managers who buy the big doormats for six buildings, and they replace them every year. But there's a lot of money to be made in the lady on Amazon buying a doormat for her home. So I've expanded into that market also and trying to service both, which is a little tricky. And I am running other than, and then now I'm <laughs> trying to do social networking. Now here's the tricky thing, is it's hard to talk about doormats day in and day out on Facebook, let me tell you. Because if I could talk about triathlon all day on Facebook, oh, I could do that. But finding new things and more innovative advice and making it interesting, so it's a challenge. So that, that's where my business has changed now, is that I am selling through multiple marketplaces, because search engine optimization is getting harder and harder to do for your own websites. And it's a challenge, but it's, it's still very fun. And I'm still running basically the same business, same business model I have with some tweaks to it. But, I, but now's the part where, since I still have 20 minutes, I want to kind of lecture you all. This is a lecture part. If any of you have a part-time job that you're making less than 10 bucks an hour right now, don't quit your job. I'm never advising that. But let's, let's talk about how you can make money right now and learn a lot in the process while you're college students. My 11-year-old is doing this. Let's talk about it. Um, selling items is good, because items are good, we all know. If you want to become an internet reseller, which is, which is essentially what I am, I'm an internet reseller, the key is going to be finding the right product. Um, and the first piece of advice I would say to you is, do you know somebody who makes something, who manufactures something, and you can get access to it at wholesale? Is it someone you know personally? Is it your uncle? Does he make barn wood frames in his backyard? Is it you? Do you make some kind of stellar craft that can't be replicated in China for less <laughs> or not as nicely? Stores you already shop from? You know, I really advise you, if you do want to be an internet reseller and you want to sell things online to make money, which is a quick way to just learn a lot of basic business concepts as your students, go through your personal context. Go through your personal places you shop. There's this. There's a store I drive past. I don't know if you'd even call it a store. It's a business I drive past all the time. It's the old highway between Spanish Fork and Springville that, um, that sells 
they're not garages, but they're just those metal roofs. You know, they'll come install a little metal cover roof. But in addition to the metal roof, I always see they have these cool looking weather vanes, these, you know, flying pigs and, and different things. I always, I've always looked at that and thought, I wonder if they're selling their weather vanes online and if they want me to go in and sell their weather vanes. So if any of you want to, go knock, go drive the old highway between Sp Springville and Spanish Fork, look for the weather vanes, go knock on the door and say, are you selling your weather vanes online? Maybe they'd say, no. You'd say, let me take some pictures of them with my iPhone, put them on eBay, put them on Amazon, put them on the website, have them shipped for you. Um, anyway, do that with your contacts you know. This guy was an MBA student of my father's a few years ago. He, his, I think it was his uncle had made a little jar opener. We've all seen these. There's nothing magical about a jar opener that goes up under there. But I guess his jar opener actually had some special adhesive so you didn't have to screw it into the cupboard. So it's thick up there and you could open your jars. So while he was an MBA student, he started selling jar openers that his uncle just had a stash of and had attempted to sell them through the TV network wonderland and it didn't didn't fly so we just got him and sold him this was my boy he's older now this is my boy when he was 11. i got him selling kt tape uh, many of you are familiar with that kt tape is an awesome company that came out of byu and they sell an it's an athletic tape i had become interested in the product because i'm an athlete and when i was helping with the center for entrepreneurship but they came in with their product and i said oh that's such a cool product and i went home and tried to buy it and they, at the time, were selling it at all the big box stores, like, you know, um, Foot Locker online for $12.99. And then Foot Locker wanted $7.99 to ship it. And that just offends me on every level. <laughs> when you got to pay, like, three-fourths of the cost for shipping. So I called the guys at KT Tape and was like, hey, you know, I have a lot of friends. We're all interested in this product. Would you let me get it from you at wholesale? I mean, it was as simple as that. I did not have a connection with these guys other than I had seen their seen their product and they were very cool and we've since become friends with the guys at KT Tape and said sure you can get it and as soon as I did that I thought but I have enough to do I'm running a real business my 11 year old can sell it and so I we built him this little website and he for about four or five years sold KT Tape and he would get the orders and it was a great process for him to learn about profit and loss and to say how much does this cost me how much am I going to sell it for and I'm going to put it in my package I'm going to ship it for a dollar instead of seven and you know he made great amount of money for an 11 year old it was like 12 grand in his mission account i let him keep a dollar per roll and the rest had to go stashed away because what does an 11 year old need money for so he thought <laughs> he had a great great business opportunity for him to learn from the process it was one product we built a very simple website that was search term you know search search term friendly did not spend one cent of marketing on it and just let it run and he's able to make money doing it another option if you cannot find something you want to sell through your own personal contacts is there are all kinds of online internet wholesalers now I must say you need to always always do your research because if someone it can get on Doba the local company they are awesome but if someone can get on Doba and pay hundred and thirty dollars a year for access to all their wholesale products which then in theory you can mark up and resell for a higher cost on your website and they'll drop ship it for you this is the theory um, anyone can do it so you do need to do your research and make sure that, that you have a profit margin there that's good um, Alibaba is fantastic if you're willing to um, <clears throat> buy stuff and stock it that's small there's stuff that's made overseas from all kinds of different countries but again some fraud can be found there so just just buy or beware but I know that some folks are saying, oh, I have this one cool product I want to sell online, but I really need a more robust offering. I want to sell other products online also. And um, if that's the case and you just kind of want to pad your website and you need some more products to sell, online wholesalers are a great way to do it, maybe to just get established. Especially if you plan to approach a local supplier or, a, or some, some supplier that you know and, they, and you've got to make yourself look credible. So you aren't just someone who comes in there and says, you don't want to sell your stuff. No, I have no website. I don't have anything. I just want to sell your stuff. Well, some people might be fine with that and let you sell it. But you'd probably be more likely to get a distributorship or to get the products at wholesale if you went in and said, here's my website. We're already having great success selling XYZ. I sell 10 of them every day. And we would like to add your product to our lineup. Our customers are asking for your product. You know, it's as simple as that. And then the people look at that and go, oh, when it might only just be simply items that are offered online at wholesale online. So check it out, it's an option. 
What you always want to remember if you are going to be an internet reseller is you want to get your product as close to the beautiful source as possible. Um, ideally, in a perfect magic world, you make the product yourself and then you sell it. But few of us actually make things and sell them. But you definitely want to be buying it as close as possible to the source of who makes it. Otherwise, there are costs each all along the way. You do not want to buy products from another middleman. Um, my, this is, isn't that the cutest belt ever? These belts are handmade in Peru. I saw my girlfriend wearing one. She's very stylish, unlike me. She always has all the good gear. And I'm like, that belt, that's so cute. And then she proceeded to tell me she paid 65 bucks for it. And I'm like, because I'm a total cheapo. So that was like making me die. I would never pay 65 bucks for a belt. But it, for some reason, it stuck in my mind. My son Rex was looking for a different item to sell because KT Tape was going different directions with their distribution with their new pro product. And I was like, hey, let's see if we can find these belts, um, find out what it costs to make them, and you can sell these. So we went on Alibaba.com, found some sellers in Peru, um, went back and forth with pictures, back and forth with a few samples, which was a little bit expensive and time consuming coming from Peru, but finally got the cool belt. And it looks just like the one sold by Sundance and by Pistol. And this costs us $16, including shipping from Peru per belt to get here. Um, and we are, and Rex is now selling a lot of these. And that's an example of seriously one product and just seeing something and saying, that's pretty damn cool. I'm going to go find who makes this. So we went straight to the supplier, and it may, all the, may be all the way in Peru. Fabulous Marlin and his, and his ladies are making some awesome belts, and I hope that it is all fair trade, because that's what he says. <laughs> like, I hope this is not a sweatshop. But I don't think it is. Um, and it's, that's an example of getting as close to the source as possible. We get them. They come here from Peru, and they're awesome box. We package them how we want. You can store you know, 50 of them in a box this big, so it's not something hard to warehouse, and my son is selling those now. Oops. Other ways to look for things to sell. As you all know, um, there's a magazine for everything in the universe. I actually used to write for a magazine called Warehousing Management Magazine. It was fabulous. I'm sure you all have it on your coffee table. And there's, if you go to the library, go to the magazine section, and say, hmm, I'm interested in crafts, <laughs> you know, or whatever it may be, get out the magazines, look at the back, especially all the little tiny ads. You'll often find new products, and sometimes right on the ads they'll say, dealers wanted. That's kind of a clue to you, oh, they want people to sell their stuff. Even if it's not dealers wanted, you can again approach the suppliers and say, hey, I really like your stuff. Two to three minutes. Oh, two to three minutes. Okay, good. I'm almost done. Um, I really like your stuff. You're fabulous. Same thing goes with trade shows. Go and look and see what's, what's good, what profit margins there are. You definitely want to, oh, this is just about if you're approaching someone. We kind of talked about this. If you are wanting to sell someone's product, be sure to look credible when you go. Don't do this. I get emails like this sometimes. For one thing, the major kiss of death right here is the fact that he's trying to buy doormats to resell from a reseller. Because I'm a reseller. He hasn't done his homework. He needs to talk to my manufacturer. Um, we'll skip the example. Profitability is a big one. You need to find out how many potential customers you have, who your competition is. You guys, this isn't hard to do. It's a couple hours. You plug in the product. You search all the web pages. You go several pages deep. You search all the marketplaces and make sure you have a profit margin. You do have to do something better than the other people. If you cannot offer a better price um, in what you're selling online, you're going to need to offer better credibility, be easier to use the website, be flashier, whatever it may be. Be sure to look at your actual costs if you're going to be a reseller, especially if you're going to resell through other marketplaces. Amazon takes a 15% cut right off the top and sits on your money for three weeks. It's not pretty, but Amazon's king. eBay takes about 10%, but then if they want to pay by PayPal, that's another 3%. You've got your credit card fees. All those little percentages add up. So especially if you're selling a small product like a Peruvian belt, you know, you've got to make sure, oh, man, another $3 added in here and your shipping costs, your cost of your package. So just be sure to add it all up and make sure. And if you've got a good, um, a good profit margin, get selling. You'll want to make sure that your product can be experienced online. You're all students. You're all busy. You don't want to talk to people on the phone. You don't want to be mailing out samples. Make sure you've got good pictures, good information, so that in theory, someone can look at your listing and know everything they need to know about that product and click Buy. 
And that's the end. So I did. I made it in time. Go be internet resellers, sell items. There's the, there's the bottom, bottom line for you. <laughs>